But tonight we'll be in Genesis chapter 39. I title it, God's Slave in a World of Power. Let's take a trip back through the lineage of Abraham. Remember in Genesis 11 that God, in Genesis 12, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to make a covenant with you. From you, Abraham, are going to come a people, a people who um, will bring forth the Messiah, who will set things right and set things in order that men might be saved. So Abraham had a son. Who was Abraham's oldest son? What was his name? Ishmael. Uh, Was Ishmael the promised son? Yes or no? Who was the promised one? Isaac. So Abraham to Isaac. Isaac had two sons. What were their names? Esau and Jacob. Esau was the red man. And then uh, Jacob was the promised one. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name got changed to what? Israel. And then he had 12 sons, and we know them as the 12 what? 12 tribes of Israel. Who were the four oldest sons? Let's see how good your memory is from three weeks ago. The four oldest sons of Jacob. Does anybody remember? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Very good. And Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah. That's what Genesis 38 was about. But now we're back to the story of Joseph. And Joseph was um, the one who was given the coat of many colors. Whether that coat was translucent and reflected all of those colors, or it looked like a rainbow, I don't know. You remember growing up and everything that you colored, you drew a rainbow on it, on Joseph's coat of many colors, and we did that 50 times, I bet, in my childhood. We was always coloring that coat. Um, it, there's a chance it could have been a white coat, like a pure white coat. But nonetheless, what happened to the coat whenever Joseph went to give a report on his brothers? What did they do to the coat? Yeah, they ripped it off of him. So they, they rip it off of him. Joseph gets sold into slavery to Ishmaelite traders. And now he winds up as a slave in Pharaoh's, uh, in Potiphar's house, and he's under the guard. So we'll pick this up in Genesis chapter 39, and we'll kind of just walk through it and go down it. As we go, I won't read it all right now. Let's look at verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. Now, Potiphar, when it says he's captain of the guard, this means that Potiphar is the head of the executioners. So he's somebody that's important, and he's somebody who is under Pharaoh's um, control and one of his main men. He's head of his execution and guard, and Joseph's now under his care. He's a slave living in Egypt. Now, I think it's by God's providence that Joseph doesn't get sold into some no-name country. Joseph winds up getting sold into the most prominent empire that the world had seen up to this point. So you're going to have one little bitty insignificant Hebrew man uh, who is part of the covenant people of God in the midst of this big world power, and he doesn't come into it as somebody mighty. He comes into it as a slave in Potiphar's house. Captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And if you underline things in your Bible, I would underline the Lord was with Joseph because that's a prominent theme all over this story. And he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now let's talk about why Joseph was so successful. When we think about success, we want to attribute it to power, to strength, to athleticism, to money, to fame, to being good at something. The reason for Joseph's success was not because of how good Joseph was. It wasn't because Joseph was so smart. The reason that God had blessed Joseph in this way was so that he would make his name great. So when it says that Joseph was successful in everything that he did, it's because God's hand was upon him. And I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but... Sometimes we think about people in business or sports teams and somebody wicked's running them that we know about. I would venture to say that there's probably somebody right in the middle of that who is a God lover, who God is blessing everyone around him just because of that godly man that's in the middle of it. And that might be some of you at work. Maybe your work's prosperous and um, maybe your boss gets filthy rich off of it because you walk with God and you're faithful, but everybody looks at you in the midst of that workplace and says, this man walks with God. Everything that he touches turns to absolute gold. This was always the picture for God's people, and this is the picture for me and you. Me and you aren't somebody because of in, innate in who we are, because we're so talented or we're so gifted. Me and you have the ability to change the cultures that we're in because God is with us, because the power of God is upon us. That's the exact same thing that was true of all the Bible characters, and specifically Joseph. I put Acts 1-8 in there 
uh, at, in your notes about the third paragraph at the bottom. And it says, but you, Jesus is speaking, telling his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the power that they have was the power that was given to them by God. Now, if you know someone who's in power, it always seems like when a man comes to power, what happens to him? People start attacking him. Whether it's people or whether a lot of people want to attribute it to Satan or whoever it is in power, um, people start attacking him. Turn with me in your Bibles right quick to Matthew chapter 3. Because as soon as Joseph comes into power in Potiphar's house, that's when the attacks are going to start coming. Well, the same is going to be true for the life of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, at the very end of it, in verse 17, we read this. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. So God the Father speaks down from heaven at Jesus' baptism. He declares He is the rightful Son. He's the one that has the power and authority, and they're to listen to Him. Well, what happens right after the Father's declaration of the Son and who He is and the power? Well, immediately we go to Matthew chapter 4, and what happens? The temptation of Jesus Christ. As soon as someone comes into power, people start coming after them. And I don't know if you've ever felt that in your life, but all of us to some degree or another, whether it's as a parent, as a grandparent, whether it's as a boss at work, or whatever our situation is, we have some form of power. And when we think about how we use the power God gives us, that's an extremely important aspect that reveals our character. How well do you use the power that God has given you in your life? Because here's the options for power. You either abuse it and take the shortcuts, or you do it the right way. Adam in the garden abused his privilege of being covenant with God. He took for granted that he was supposed to protect his wife, and he didn't do it. But then Jesus Christ, whenever he's tempted in Matthew chapter um, He's tempted in Matthew chapter 4. Satan offers him the kingdoms of the world. Uh, he, he keeps offering him all these different things. And just like Joseph, Christ overcomes the temptation. So that's a parallel in the life of Joseph and the life of Christ, that they come into power and they're continually tempted. There will be more parallels to come. Let's keep going in Genesis 39. Look with me in verse 3. I hear you, buddy. I hear you. Verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. If you have somebody and God blesses everything that they do, they may not tell you, but, but we see that, don't we? We see when God's hand is on somebody. You ever looked at somebody or told somebody, man, God's hand is all over you. And I see it, and it's so evident that God's using you, and he's doing something in you. But we see those people when we identify them. And naturally, if, you have, if you're Potiphar and, jo and Joseph's in your care, and God's blessing everything that he does. Every time he turns around, he does something good, and he makes you money. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to give Joseph every opportunity to do things uh, that there is. And eventually, you're going to elevate him to the head of your household, which is what Potiphar did to Joseph. When I was working at the car dealership, <laughs> I think this is cheating in the car dealership. Somebody can testify to this. But we had a salesman that was better than all of the other salesmen. Uh, salesmen talk about the closing rate. Can you close? When what percentage of customers that you talk to wind up buying a car? And so that's like the competition. Like you can't close and you can't close. So we had one salesman who was so much better than everybody else. When people would drive up on the lot, the GM would start giving all the customers to this one salesman. Why? Because he was selling 300 cars a year and he could close. He could get the deal done and everybody else would make money on it. That's the same idea with Joseph. Now that's probably cheating and I don't think you're supposed to do that. But still, you want to make the money. You do it. The dude is, a, I mean, he's a car selling machine. He's, he's going to sell another 300 this year, I bet. But that's Joseph in the house of Potiphar. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. You know, I can't guarantee that God's going to make you prosper in every way that you turn. But the best advice I can give you is that, number one, that's your desire. Do you desire that God blesses you, that, that God prospers you? Do you realize that God can do more in your life than you could ever do for yourself? Or, um, and then, secondly, I would tell you to walk with God as close as you can because I believe with all my heart, in the middle of a wicked pagan empire in Egypt, Joseph's trying his best to walk with God, to stand out uh, to the best of his ability. Verse 4, 
So Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight. He served him. Then he made him the overseer. And it's funny that that's kind of like the pastor word of his house. And all that he had put under his authority. This is the second time in two chapters that Joseph has been put in authority. Remember his dad, he was the son that his dad loved. His dad put him in authority and he was to give judgment over his brothers. But what happened? How was his authority removed in the story of his brothers? His robe that he had was ripped off. We keep reading here in verse 5. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the Egyptians would have thought that they were superior to everyone else. You bring a Hebrew in here, Potiphar, you're putting this guy in charge? But then there's a blessing that comes whenever Joseph is put in charge. And you know what the, what the Jews thought about everybody else? The Jews looked at everybody else, and they said, well, they're dogs. The Gentiles are dogs. We don't want anything to do with them. We, it, they're not part of the covenant people of God. They're lesser than us. But now Joseph's causing the Egyptians to prosper. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that Potiphar had in the house and in the field. Well, don't you know Pharaoh was bragging on Potiphar for Joseph's sake. Verse 6. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he did not know what he had except for bread, which he ate. And that's another way to say it is Joseph took care of literally everything for Potiphar. All he did was wake up in the morning, go play golf, come home and eat, and then go to sleep. That's what he did. All right? So that, that was Potiphar's life, and Joseph was taking care of his household. Good life, right? Wrong. You know what that reminds me of? Potiphar was only concerned, and I think the text points this out on purpose. The Bible does this and stuff, so notice it. The text points out that Potiphar, was only, he wasn't concerned about anything else. He was only concerned about what he ate. Can you think of another story in Genesis that we've read so far where someone forsook everything else that was going on around him for a bowl of soup? You've got a new Esau in this story is what you have. You have someone that doesn't care anything about what God's doing, only the pleasures that's going on around him. Bottom of verse 6 says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That'll be important. It came to pass after these things, that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Now, we don't get told Potiphar's wife's name, but I could probably think of a couple names I could give her if y'all wanted me to, uh, but I'll pass. <laughs> but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Pretty strong. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Right? No. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph, how long? She tempted him once. It, isn't that the pattern of temptation in our life, too? Don't you just wish that you get tempted once, you overcome it, and then it's gone away with forever? Uh, why, why is that not the pattern? Like, why can we not get that? What happens with temptation? Whatever it is for you. I know men are tempted differently than women. If you're older, you're tempted differently than younger folks. Why is that? Why is the temptation there? Day after day after day after day after day. This is a biblical principle that you don't overcome temptation once. You overcome temptation uh, by a lifestyle, by a life conformed to the image of God, by doing it day after day after day. Is it hard? Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that is. For whatever temptation it is that lies ahead of us. For Joseph, though, he had set aside some things, and um, even though it was recurring, he had success with it. Let's keep reading here. What verse am I in? Ten. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. Uh-oh. 
we got a time when nobody's in there. Why would it be beneficial for Joseph for everybody else to be in the house? Well, they can testify and say, I didn't do it. Hold your spot right quick. Just hold your spot and go to Genesis chapter 4. Hold it and go to Genesis 4. I can't think of a verse that sums up Joseph's situation any better than this. Genesis 4, verse 7, we read, If you do well, you will, not, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Well, for Joseph, this is Potiphar's wife, who is literally lying at the door. Verse 11, but it happened, back in Genesis 39, But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his what? Robe or garment. Same thing. Saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand And he fled outside that she called the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought Potiphar. He has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard, and I lifted my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. This is another pattern that we see all throughout the book of Genesis. Anytime the wicked people can't usurp The righteous people, what do they do to them? Lie. Every time they keep lying. How many times have you ever been lied on for the sake of righteousness in your life? You're not the first one that it's ever happened to. And neither was Joseph. Turn with me over to the book of Proverbs right quick, if you will. I want to look at Proverbs chapter 5. In Proverbs chapter 5, we read about exactly the kind of woman that Potiphar's wife was. And here's the wisdom that I think Joseph would give to anyone who is in his situation. And I think that this is wisdom that we need to give to our young men. And And likewise, I think it would be beneficial if you have daughters to read it to them as well. Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. We read this. My son, pay attention to wisdom. Now, wisdom is knowledge applied. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion. You're going to make some decisions. And your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, Maybe good for a moment, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood. And if you'll remember back to the Exodus story, uh, that whenever they got outside in the Exodus, they, they came up to a place and all they had to drink was wormwood. Remember what happened in the story with the wormwood? God told Moses, he said, throw this log, throw this tree into the cursed poison wormwood water. And what happened when he threw the tree in? It became what? Sweet. That's the same image as the cross that Christ took on the curse and the tree made what was a curse sweet. Anyway, sorry. But the end shall be as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Well, she progressed quickly. Her steps lay hold of hell, lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her. Sound like the story of Joseph? I would say he's a pretty good model. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one, lest aliens be filled, that's foreigners, be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and say, how have I hated instruction? Meaning not listening to stay away from this type of woman. And my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor incline my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin, 
in the midst of the assembly of the congregation. Proverbs 6 picks it up. Look at Proverbs 6, verse 23. It reads, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her lure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. And an adulteress will prey upon his precision of life. Now, in that, in that idea of prey, I was listening to some documentary, and they estimated that John Kennedy had been with over a thousand women in his lifetime. It, it seems like this is drawn to people who are in power, and that was exactly her desire for Joseph. As as much as as much as this was about sex, even more, this was about power and about the power that Joseph had. And the reason that I think I can say that is because of the garment. Notice all the emphasis that's in this on the garment. See, in verses 3 and in verses 6 of the early part of Genesis 39, it kept saying that God's hand was with Joseph and that everything that Potiphar had, he had put into Joseph's hand, meaning he put everything into Joseph's power. This garment or this robe is the representation of power, this power that was given him because he's, part of the covenant people of God, but now given to him by Potiphar. So this woman was coming after his power. Verse 26, For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Now let me help you with this interpretation. Can, do we really think that we can sit around in this temptation, and in this lust, and in this idea of saying it's all right to be around it, and not be burned and something not happen to us? No. What's the appropriate response whenever we're in these situations, whether it's temptation for drugs, for alcohol, whether it's friends we don't need to be around, whether it's pornography, whatever it is, what's the temptation that we have to, that we have to do? Right, how do we get out of it? Run. Flee. Get out of it. If it's in a relationship, whatever it is, get out of it. Verse 28. Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Let's go back to Genesis 39. So we have her coming after him. And she begins to tell the lie. She's after his glory and his dominion that this garment represents. Um, and I don't know if y'all know this or not, but you and I wear a garment. I'm not talking about your outer coat either. Because we all have on a different outer coat. But the garment that we do wear is the garment of the clothing of the righteousness of Christ. And when we're saved, we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Now you think about it all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Remember when Adam was in God's presence originally? Did he have any kind of clothing on? No, they were naked and they didn't know it. Why? Because they hadn't sinned in the presence of God yet. There wasn't any, there wasn't any shame. But whenever they sinned, they recognized that they had sinned against God. And there was shame and nakedness in their life. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, you remember what they did? They made themselves what? Clothing out of fig leaves. But their garment or their clothing that they put on themselves, it wasn't good enough. So God begins this substitutionary clothing of garments. What God clothed them with? He killed an animal and he placed this garment over Adam and Eve. They were naked, but they were under the garment. And that's the spiritual picture that gets carried all the way through the Bible, God keeps providing a temporary garment, so to speak, spiritually, all the way through animal sacrifice until one day Christ Jesus comes. Now, I want you to look in your notes on the back page. Right in the middle of the back page, I put Galatians 3, 27. And I put it in the NASB because I like this translation for the point I'm trying to make. Galatians 3, 27 says, for all of you who are baptized spiritually, you're born again. Who All of you who are baptized into Christ have what? Clothed yourself with Christ. So some form of power or dominion was given them. Now that's not a physical garment. Paul wasn't telling the churches at Galatia, well, we, whenever you guys joined the church, we gave you all some special t-shirt and a handout. You put on a garment. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about being clothed with the righteousness 
of Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 5, they said they were partly clothed, but they desired to be fully clothed. Now, when would that fully idea of being fully clothed happen? Well, what she was wanting, now stay with me because I know you're thinking, but keep thinking here. What Potiphar's wife was wanting was essentially for Joseph to come to her and spread the garment over both of them, meaning they would both be naked under the garment like Adam and Eve were, meaning that the two would become one and they would be wed together under that garment. See, what happens when we come to relationship now for me and you in Christ Jesus, we're married and we're wed to him. So he is our groom and we're his bride and our nakedness is in connection to Christ and we're clothed with his garment as a church and it's over us. Well, what, what's the implications of that? That you and I have the right to rule, a, a right to rule because we're so great? No, we rule in the stead of Christ here on the earth. We have the glory and the dominion of the righteousness and the, and the clothing of Christ. And I think that's part of the picture that really needs to be laid out here in Genesis chapter 39 because she wants his garment for specific reasons. Remember when Noah was in his tent? Remember what the Bible says when Noah was in his tent? Not this Noah, the other Noah that was on the ark. He got off the ark. He built a garden. He went in his tent after he got drunk in Genesis 8 or 9. And remember what Ham did? Ham came in there, and what did he do? He unclothed him. He revealed his nakedness. And what happened to Ham? He was cursed because of that exact thing. Judah was the one who sold uh, Joseph into slavery. But now, Joseph's been elevated again in Potiphar's house, but he's lost another garment. Well, the story gets better for Joseph as we continue here. Look at verse 16 in Genesis 39. So she kept the garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. Liar. So it happened, as I lifted up my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. Can I tell you this, friends? The world hates the righteous rule of the people who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They don't, I don't know if you know it or not, they do not like us. And it ain't just because of who you are or whatever, it's because you try to rule and establish the reign of Christ in your community, in your home, and in your life. I feel the same tension that you feel. I feel the same tension teaching the Word of God and teaching His righteous standards and precepts that you feel in the community. I know you feel it. Doesn't it feel like wickedness is everywhere around you? And like you're placed right smack dab in the middle of it? That's the way I feel a lot of times. Well, that's exactly what Joseph was. He was an island of righteousness in a big sea of wickedness. There was probably a day when it wasn't like that in our country. I don't know that I saw it, but, but I think a lot of you guys saw it. You can probably remember a day back in the 50s or 60s and say, and it just, it just seemed like things were different. It seemed like there was a reverence for God. Friends, don't get it wrong. People have been wanting to strip God and his people of his rule ever since then. There's nothing that the world would love more than to see me and you. And you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your effect on society. And there's nothing that wicked people would love to see more than God's people who say they rule in God's stead go out and live in sin so they can bash your name all over the street so that you don't have any influence. They've been wanting to rip our robes off ever since we were saved. And it's not anything new. Go to Matthew chapter 27. The life of Christ is all over the life of Joseph. In Matthew chapter 27 and beginning in verse 27. We read this. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a what? Scarlet robe on him. Uh-oh. They mocked him. He's got a robe now. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, Genesis 3 and the curse was placed on Christ, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And what's funny is, and I, this is a side note, doesn't have anything to do with this, but people say, you know how they wrote over the top of, of his 
of his head on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Remember how it said that? Remember when the Jews came to the Romans? They came to Pontius Pilate and they were like, y'all got to take that down. Remember that? Here's why they wanted it taken down. Because in Hebrew, Jesus of Nazareth, remember he wrote it in like three different languages. In Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. In Hebrew, it read Y-H-W-H. Those were the first letters of each word. Literally, they wrote over the top of Jesus' head, Yahweh, God, and they wanted him down. He's not Yahweh. Remember, he kept saying, I'm, I'm God, I'm the one. And they didn't want it. Anyway, I just thought that was cool. That's free. You don't have to pay me for that. You don't, have to, don't give him tithe money on that one. That's fine. Verse 30. He's clothed in the robe, and they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they mocked him, they did what? Took the robe off of him symbolizing that his power was gone. They put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to be crucified. Friends, can I tell you that three days later, though, Christ Jesus rose. He was clothed far greater than what I think anyone could ever imagine, um, meaning spiritually that he had overcome death in the grave. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a story. See how all of these things are connected? You start following robe themes all the way in the Bible. Just trace that kind of stuff. When you're studying your Bible, like, man, if you're on Google, like, just Google or put it in your Bible app, robes or garments, and trace those words and, and see how it's used because it'll start to paint a picture for you, and you can see how it's all throughout the Bible. Let's finish Genesis chapter 39, verse 19. So it was when his master heard the words of his wife, that is why I spoke to him, saying, Your servant did this to me in this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Verse 21, here we go again. But the Lord was with Joseph. When he was back at home with Jacob, the Lord was with Joseph. When they threw him in the pit, the Lord was with Joseph. When he got sold into Ishmaelite slavery, the Lord was with Joseph. When he was high up on the hill in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with Joseph. He's back down in prison, and guess what? The Lord is still with Joseph. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. This man can't do any wrong. Why? Because God's with him. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Man, he was in charge of his brothers. Then he was in charge of Potiphar's house. Now he's in charge of everybody in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, just like Potiphar didn't, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Now let's ask a question. What wrong do we see Joseph doing in the story? Is there some kind of wrong that Joseph did? Because I think a lot of times what we think in our lives is that, boy, we did something wrong and God just punished us. Go to John chapter 9 right quick, and I'll close here. I really wish people understood this, because the way that me and you think this works, and I think subconsciously, maybe even sometimes I think it works, is that, boy, I do really good, and I live a righteous life, and God's going to reward me, and there's going to be all this blessing, and everything's going to just be perfect and peachy and dandy. And if I get in sin, then God's going to cause you know me to drive my car off into a ditch or something like that. Do you all think that way sometimes? I think a lot of people think that way. And I think people in the Bible thought that way because of John chapter 9, verse 1. Watch this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? See, he was blind, therefore somebody sinned. This man or his parents, that he was born blind. See, that, that's the way we think life works. They did something wrong. Something bad happens. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I think you could apply John chapter 9 and verse 3 to the life of Joseph. What Joseph do wrong? Nothing. If you want to say there's one thing Joseph might have did wrong, he should have kept his mouth shut when he told his brothers and his parents that dream. Other than that, I think he was all right. Why? Why did all that happen? Why did the bad things happen in his life? Why? 
because he was so wrong, because God was paying him back? You ever heard anybody say, well, God's just paying me back for the way? No, he's not. If God was going to pay you back, he wouldn't have sent Jesus and killed him. If God was going to pay you back, he'd have sent you straight to hell. God's been good to us. He's been gracious to us. Friends, those things that are happening bad in your life, they're not necessarily because you sin. Now, are there consequences to sin in your life? If I go out and murder somebody, is there a consequence to it? Yes, and a just consequence. But that doesn't mean that every time I do something wrong, God's going to pay me back with something bad. So don't think of it in that way. All right? I hope that was enjoyable to you. Think about the garment. I think the garment's really the key to Genesis chapter 39 and that story. We'll see a lot more to come with Joseph. Are y'all bored of Genesis yet or plugging right along? We good? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I pray it's a blessing to our folks. Lord, there's a lot of parallels in the life of Christ and the life of Joseph. And God, I pray we'd keep studying them. Lord, our country, I would say, is probably in the most wicked years of its existence. If there was ever a time that we needed righteous people to stick out in the midst of something that was evil, God, it's now. Lord, give us the ability to stand in the face of temptation, to stand in the face of evil like Joseph. Lord, as we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, Lord, we've got on a far better garment than what Joseph had taken off of him by Potiphar's wife. It's a righteousness, Lord, that's sealed by the Holy Spirit of God in faith. And God, I pray that you would use us. Lord, use us in the midst of this people. Whether we work in this town or a different town or where we raise our family at. Lord, use your word to be a lamp to us and a light to us. Lord, use your law in that way. Lord, keep us from the seductress woman of Proverbs 5 and 6. Lord, allow us to flee like Joseph from all the temptation that's in our life. Lord, let us take sin seriously because it crouches at the door. Lord, just as Genesis 4, 7, we must master it. And Lord, we won't master it on our own. We'll master it through your word, through your spirit, and your power in us. We love you, God. In your name, amen.